from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's The Cube. Now, here are your hosts, Dave Vellante and Stu Miniman. For several years now, the analysts at Wikibon have been talking about taking the cloud, the public cloud operating model and bringing it to your data, wherever that data lives. Hi everybody, this is Dave Vellante and I'm here with my co-host, Stu Miniman. Welcome to HCI, a foundation for IT transformation. We're here with Chad Dunn, who's the Vice President of Product Management and Marketing at Dell EMC. Chad, good to see you again, thanks for coming on. Yeah, glad to be here, good to spend time with you guys. So we talk a lot about you know, VxRail, mm -hmm. um, speaking of foundations. Um, give us a quick update, you know, what is it and what's new with VxRail? Okay, um, well big news in VxRail land, right? We just completed our transition onto the 14th generation of Dell PowerEdge servers. So this gives us a substantially more powerful platform, a substantially more predictable performance, and a lot more configuration options that, that make it fit a lot of different workloads that our customers have. So it really makes it prime time for HCI. So wh where's the power and performance come from? Is that pr predominantly kind of new compute? That's a, that's a big piece of it. Um, some of that is, is software as well, right? vSAN underlies VxRail as a software defined storage layer. And we've seen pretty amazing increases in performance just from software from, um, from our 13G to our 14G transition. But when we look at that performance now on 14G servers with the Intel Skylake chipset, uh, we're seeing um, 2x performance over the last generation and we're seeing latencies that are very, very low. Mm -hmm. And that has to do with more and faster memory channels, more threads, overall faster processors. So really off the hook in terms of performance that we're seeing. Yeah. Chad, when we look at HCI, it's really about the software layer. Often it gets overlooked. You know, what actually has to happen between the software and that underlying hardware? Are sure. there optimizations? Does it matter uh, if I'm using the software? When, yep. You know, what's optimized for that next generation Intel chip? Yeah, um, yeah, it's all about the software, or, or so a software vendor would say, but we, we know that um, when you're treating something as a system, you need that hardware and that software to work together in, in perfect unison as a system. And you know, we've done a lot in this generation working with the PowerEdge team to make sure that we have the right hardware hooks and design points that are, that are focused on HCI. You know, that goes from you know, things like the devices that we use to boot up and where we would execute uh, the, the hypervisor kernel to network connectivity and really importantly to the in-band channels that we use to update all the little pieces of firmware that, that operate the hardware inside the system, right? You need to be able to treat those as a system, update, lifecycle, manage those all in context of one another. So having you know, direct and, and deep, meaningful access into that hardware is critically important when you're operating a system like this. Yeah, when, when we look at kind of our cloud strategy in ge general, it's, it's about the data. And when we talk yeah. about data, it's things like predictability and latency, mm -hmm. it, it's about kind of the power of the underlying yeah. thing. Maybe give us a little bit more specifics as to you yeah. know, what, what, what you're getting in this generation. So the, the big difference here above and beyond the performance, which is about 2x what we saw from the last generation, if we look at the same hardware, um, or the same software running on the two different pieces of hardware, about 100% better. Uh, but that's really just part of the story. It's the, the predictability of latency that, that's critically important. If you're going to migrate tier one workloads onto this infrastructure, you need to ensure that other workloads are not going to disturb that performance. So when we look at this, we look at how the, the IOs per second increases, and we look at the overall latency. How long does that latency line stay flat? Right, so when we look at this generation, you know, we see you know, over 2x the IOPS, but the, the, the horizontal line where we look at the response time and latency, it stays flat nine times longer in this generation than in the last. So you've got that sub millisecond response time, even at very, very high IOPS. So you can put a lot of different workloads on that same infrastructure, still get predictable performance. I think the other thing that people don't understand is that they said, oh, HCI, it's just like, it's that little Lego block you build. But it's yeah. not just one Lego block. Yeah. What are you seeing from customers? What, what's kind of the portfolio? Yeah. What are the decisions <coughs> that they have to make to kind of pick the right configuration? Sure. So, you know, when you're a kid and you get your first Lego set, you, you get a lot of pretty generalized blocks. They're all, you know, square and uh, some are rectangle, but not a lot of variability. When you get up into the big leagues of, of the Lego Star Wars set, right, you've got a lot of specialized parts and you can do really advanced, really cool things. That's really where we're at with HCI right now. If, if you want to really tune the infrastructure for the workloads that you have, you need a lot of variability in the processors that you choose, the amount of memory, the speed of memory, and even the storage. It could be hybrid. Some people still choose hybrid uh, HDDs. 
Uh, but even within Flash, you know, people will choose um, SAS or SATA drives depending on the performance and, and, uh, and cost benefits that they want to realize. So being able to you know, scale up and down the processors, the memory, different types of storage is critically important so you can fit into those different workloads. Also, you know, a lot more people use this for VDI and for high-end imaging, so the ability to, to pack these things full of graphical processing units and still be able to power and cool the things is critically important. We have a lot of applications in those verticals where there's, there's video processing and these are required. So we don't just have one model of VX Rail, we've got a number of different VX Rail models, all of which can scale up and then of course HCI um, intrinsically can scale out. So that lets you really fine tune it and get to that expert level in terms of your, your Lego building blocks. So Chad, a minute ago you mentioned workload. So as you're bringing this sort of 14th generation server technology to VX Rail, how has it affected workloads? What are you seeing as the sweet spot for workloads? So if I were to, to think back a year, the question that every customer would ask is, how do I know which workload is right for HCI? And a lot of times they even lack the, the vocabulary and, and, and taxonomy to say, okay, that fits, that doesn't fit. What's happened in the meantime though, are the software has gotten so much better, the hardware has gotten so much faster and more predictable, that the question is, well, what workloads are not right for HCI yet? And there are very few that aren't. So um, we've seen people generally start off with one workload, right? Maybe it's VDI, maybe it's a database. And then they start to move other, you know, as they get comfortable with it, they move other workloads over to it. Um, obviously, we've got a big install block uh, or install base of VX block and VBlock. We see a lot of those customers start to migrate workloads from there onto a layer of HCI, and more and more of those are becoming tier one workloads. Um, Crate and Barrel is a, a great example, a great customer of ours. They're moving their uh, point of sale systems onto VX Rail. Now for a retailer, your point of sale system, that's about as mission critical as you can possibly get. So you know, they and others now have the confidence to start to move these, these things over. The only outliers that we see are, are some of these you know, very big data applications that are hugely write intensive, and um, we actually usually end up selling a layer of hyperconverged with our Isilon arrays to store that data and then put a layer of hyperconverged compute around it um, because in, in some ways hyperconverged is just a better way to server, if you know what I mean. What if we could talk about the business impact? What are customers seeing? How are they quantifying the, the value mm -hmm. of, of these systems? Share some stories or color there. Sure, um, it's all about operational expense savings, right? How much more efficiently am I going to be able to operate this infrastructure? Uh, it's not so much about capital acquisition costs. So when you, you look at the typical operational expense savings, and that comes from us doing all the lifecycle management of the hardware, of the software, of the cluster as a system, you see those costs go down. A um, really good example is uh, First Credit of, of British Columbia, uh, another one of our good customers. Now they've, they've deployed this, they've seen 30% OPEX savings, and they've seen 50% power and, and space savings. So, yeah, you get a smaller package because you don't have separate um, storage array, separate servers, but you also have really you know one function that needs to operate your environment, and that's the the virtual administrator. Mm -hmm. You know, he or she is the one that really operates everything. You don't have separate storage, separate compute, separate virtualization teams that have to look after the infrastructure. So, yeah, first run is very easy, very fast to deploy but it's you know, day through day two through day 700 and day 900 where you see that recurring operational expense savings where it really pays off for customers. All the updates and life cycle management. Yeah. Yeah. So Chad, you, you talk about the success and all, all the customers. What about the customers that haven't looked at kind of the HCI space yet? What are they missing? You know, what, do, what do you say to those customers that maybe you know, are, aren't sure if the, the, the water's right to jump in yet? The, so th there's really three ways that you, you're going to encounter a customer who's going to consider HCI. Uh, you're either going to refresh a server, right? It's, you know, your, your servers are up for maintenance and you're going to take a look at HCI as the next step in your evolution of your, your, compute, uh, your compute strategy. Or you're going to refresh your storage and you're going to look at hyperconverges, the next step in the evolution of your storage strategy. Or you've got that one workload that's probably net new and it's going to be sort of an isolated case and they need an infrastructure and they need to stand it up fast. That, that's, that third case is really the one that, that drove the initial adoption of HCI. I can't tell you how many of our customers started with VDI. I mean, it's so cliche now to talk about VDI as a, as a killer app for HCI, but that's how so many people started because it's, it's you know, a very bound and isolated infrastructure. And from there, they get comfortable with it and they start to bring other workloads onto it. So if you're thinking about 
refreshing your servers. If you're thinking about refreshing storage, it's time to kick the tires on HCI. If you've got a workload that you need to stand up quickly and you don't know how big it's gonna be, you know, one, two, three years down the road, HCI is another, uh, it's another opportunity to look at HCI because you can start with a very small infrastructure, but you can grow it to a very, very large one. I wonder if we could talk a little bit about uh, digital transformation. I mean, everybody's talking about digital transformation and to us, digital transformation is all about how you leverage data and the edge is exploding. Mm -hmm. We've envisioned uh, sort of a three-tier data model. You get the edge, you get maybe an aggregation point and you yeah. bring it back to the cloud. And that cloud can be the public cloud or it can be on-prem. So you've got to have some kind of cloud infrastructure to manage yeah. all this data. So where does uh, this fit in the context of, of transformations and, and why does hardware matter? Yeah, um, well, let's, let's go from the end and, and work back to the beginning, right? Hardware matters uh, because of, of form factor, for one. For one. Uh, as you start to push compute out to the edge, right? You want form factors that are you know, small, don't consume a lot of power, mm -hmm. but you know still have a lot of processing power and, and can manipulate that data, right? The whole Internet of Things phenomenon that is creating all this data out at the edge, you know, presents us with a with a, a conundrum, right? The data itself is not that valuable. The insights that we get from the data are immensely valuable. Bringing all that data back to the core to do something with is not cost effective. So. It's how do we turn the data at the edge into information and then how do we funnel that valuable information back to the core and leave the unvaluable data out where it is. Um, Hyperconverge fits really well there because you can have you know, devices of very small form factors that are very quick to deploy, very easy to manage remotely. At the aggregation point, you can have simply larger versions of the same thing or more of the same thing and then finally at the core, you can have very large clusters of, of hyperconverged appliances like VxRail um, to do your processing. Now the key is, from an operational perspective, you've still got a single pane of glass that manages everything, right? Mm -hmm. It's still the same set of tools, it's still the same hardware and software lifecycle management process that happens out at the edge, at the aggregation point, and at the core. So again, it comes back to the operational expense of making decisions closer to the data and then managing everything with a consistent set of tools. So I wonder if we could also talk about the competition. And when Stu and I think about the competition in this sphere, we look at, well first of all, this is all sort of software defined. Everything's yeah. moving to software defined. So we see two vectors. One is head-to-head -head competition with other software defined suppliers. Yep. And the second big competitor is, hey, I'm just going to roll my own. Right, right. So let's start with the former. Why Dell EMC versus you know, vendor A, B, C, or D? Sure, sure. Um, it really gets down to what your goal is as a customer. And we obviously have multiple options within our own, our own portfolio. And those perfectly you know, find solutions for a lot of people. Um, but you know, number one, if you're a, a VMware user and you want to optimize around the VMware user experience, then VxRail is the way to go. Um, because we, we do co-engineer this with VMware. Uh, it's not just a regular partnership. We have engineers and, and marketing people and product managers at VMware that functionally roll up to our team. Mm -hmm. And so we do behave as one engineering, one product management organization to really optimize the user experience for, for VMware. Secondly, ar architecturally from a, a vSAN perspective, this is a service that's baked into the kernel of vSphere. Mm -hmm. So in terms of performance and the overhead that it creates on CPU, memory, et cetera, this is the best game in town. Uh, we can do more I.O., more predictably with, the, with flatter latency than really any other solution that's on the market in the HCI space. Every other one takes a, a virtual storage appliance approach where they have something running on top of the hypervisor right. with a very long and circuitous data path. Um, we'll performance test against solutions like that all day long, every day. That that's, doesn't worry us at all. Um, so again, if you're a vSphere customer, VMware customer, it's the most obvious choice. And from a performance perspective, you're not giving up anything, right? We don't want users to have to sacrifice the storage functionality to the performance of the compute functionality. You, you Just because it's hyper-converged and you scale out doesn't mean you can compromise on any of those axes. Okay, what about the guys who like like to change their own oil in the car yeah. and the spark plugs and tune it up sure. and you know, they want to roll time. down? It's been a long time <laughs> since I've been able to work on my own car. Um, but, all right, so I encounter these kinds of customers all the time. It, it's the build your own crowd and it's what they've been doing for a long time. And it's great, all right? I build my own you know, computers at home, right? And I have my own ESX server at home that I, that I put together. I can't afford it next rail. Um, <laughs> but there's no, there's no employee discount. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you a story that, that, that sort of will hopefully make sense, right? My first job when I got into this business, I, I went to, uh, to Boston College. 
my first job in work study was to keep a spreadsheet that had all the MAC addresses and all the IP addresses for every host on the BC network <laughs> and keep those in sync. That's You're really good at that, I bet. I was, I was excellent <laughs> at that. That is not a skill set that, that is in demand right now, or really even at that time. Um, but when you think about what it means to take a software-defined storage product like VMware vSAN and take a, an x86 server and put those together, yes, you're getting to the same destination of running vSphere on a host with software-defined storage. You're missing the systemness, right? Um, we go to a lot of trouble to make sure that we're managing all of those things in context at the cluster level. All of the little pieces of firmware, and there are roughly 12 or so pieces of firmware that we have to take care of, from the BIOS to the drive controller firmware, the drives, the boss card, which is our boot media, the iDRAC firmware, the backplane, power supplies. Um, at EMC, we, in, in legacy EMC, we spent 30 years building arrays. We had all of those same challenges with all the different pieces of firmware and software that all had to function as a system, and we did that. And we guaranteed that it would live up to five nines of availability for the customer. That's exactly what we do when we deliver VX Rail as hyperconverged. If you want to choose to build those things yourself, that's fine if you have the skills and that's how you want to operate your business. The five nines is now on you though, right? Because you're the one responsible for, for bringing all those parts together. So yeah, it's certainly a valid path for others, but the, the market is shifting and we see more often than not people are, are moving toward a buy approach well, rather than build. You, you bring up a great point. You know, I, I remember back in the, the early days before we even called it HCI, you think about Visa and, oh, well, is the storage admin going to buy it? Is the virtualization mm -hmm. admin going to yeah, take yeah. that over? Um, and what's excited me about this wave is the, oh, here's the cool stuff that companies are doing now that they're yeah. not spending their time keeping spreadsheets and MAC yeah, addresses. Yeah, exactly. what, 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 do you, what is the kind of you know owner of this look like in your environments and any cool stories you're hearing from customers transforming yeah. their organization? Um, yeah. right, by, and, by and large, the, um, the, the, the operator of this is your virtual admin, right? The person who is at home in vCenter, in VR ops, with you know, maybe even VRA if they're going full infrastructure as a, as a service, that's really the user of this, right? And, and the dynamic you mentioned is similar to what we had with vBlock, right? Customers who went vBlock who said, I'm going to change my operating model to a virtual administrator versus compute, storage, network. Um, you know, customers who didn't change the operating model were not happy vBlock customers. You know, ones that, that did change the model didn't. And uh, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you a real off-script off anecdote. Um, recently I was traveling in Europe and I started playing a game with the sales guy we were traveling with because in Europe very often, you know, they have more of an affinity to putting their logos on the sides of buildings in, in a lot of European cities. So as we would go to these different cities and we went from Stockholm all the way down to Rome to Switzerland to, to Amsterdam, yeah, you know, we're just spotting VX Rail customers, right? Who's, who's going to spot the most? And the one really interesting one is we checked into a hotel you know, late night in Switzerland. Next morning we meet for breakfast. He goes, did you spot the rail customer? I said, who was it? We went into the bathroom and they have these, uh, you know, squeeze bottles that have the soap in the, in the shower. And it's a cosmetics company and they're located in Germany. And they, they do obviously a ton of business all over Europe. And they had outsourced a lot of their IT because, you know, their core competency is not IT, it's cosmetics. And they now have one guy that looks after all of IT for this company rather than outsource it to two different companies to manage all this. And he runs it all on VX Rail. So transformative, yes, to that company, very transformative, but at a very small scale. But that pattern sort of repeats itself the higher, in, the higher that you scale. All right, we're out of time, but uh, where can people go to get more information on, on this and other product, your HCI strategy? If I were them, I'd go to, to uh, dellemc.com slash HCI. Excellent, Chad. Thanks very much, Stu. Appreciate you co-hosting with me. And uh, check out the videos on, uh, on thecube.net. This and other videos will be up there. Thanks for watching, everybody. Dave Vellante for Stu Miniman. We'll see you next time. <laughs>